Today I'm going to tell you about our latest work in uh, using the Buckingham Pi theorem to discover dimensionless numbers from data. This is work I've done with my colleagues, uh, Jared Callahan, Stephen Brunton, and Nathan Kutz. So what's the difference between a flying hummingbird and a swimming microorganism? It's not the equations that describes the dynamics of the fluid surrounding them. The Navier-Stokes equation describes both air and water. The difference is in the scales, the scales, uh, the length scales, the viscosity scales, the velocity scales. And all these differences in scales are illustrated and quantified by just one number, the Reynolds number. The hummingbird has um, a fluid surrounding it with a Reynolds number of close to 10,000 in that order. And a swimming microorganism has a Reynolds number of uh, liquid around it uh, much less than one. And this means that they experience their surrounding in a very different way, and the dynamics of the fluid surrounding them is also very different. Here, the di you can expect the dynamics to be very laminar and with parallel velocity fields, but here it's a very chaotic um, fluid that's happening around it. And um, you can see that in the equations uh, of the Navier-Stokes equation, where you can get rid of uh, a term if the Reynolds number is very small, so the qualitative solution is very different, and the qualitative nature of um, the dynamics is also very different. And this is just one example of so many dimensionless numbers that you can find in physics in general and in fluid dynamics in particular. So dimensionless numbers have played a very important role in the development of physics and um, you can um, appreciate that as you go deeper into complex systems where we don't really understand the dynamics, we don't have clear equations, but we know that there are some numbers that will quantify some bifurcations, some changes in the qualitative nature, and therefore um, changes in, in the whole uh, behavior of the system. Now, um, dimen no, no getting these dimensionless numbers is a very important part also of going from a very high dimensionless parameter space, a uh, very high dimensional parameter space, like um, having uh, mu L rho F and V and um, going to a lower dimensional space where here in the Navier-Stokes equation you just get Struhl and the Reynolds number. And we know for low Reynolds number we have uh, laminar flow, a higher Reynolds number we have turbulence, and uh, for higher Struhl number we can look at uh, frequencies that uh, change also the oscillations, uh, oscillations in the fluid, that quantify oscillations in the fluid. Uh, why am I talking about all this? To tell you that dimensionless numbers are very important. They approximate nonlinear dynamics, they um, uh, quantify the bifurcations, and, and uh, they play an important role in scaling for discovering new uh, equations and for discovering also solutions from, uh, uh, from given equations. They're also a very good way of uh, reducing the dimensionality of your input and output parameter space without losing any information, and they can be done without modeling. How? With the Buckingham Pi theorem. But the Buckingham Pi theorem doesn't give you a unique set of uh, dimensionless groups, so we want to use data to do that. Now, uh, the motivation is that they're not known in many systems, like in, in fluid dynamics, we know Reynolds number. Sometimes it's hard to define Reynolds number in some contexts, but uh, in some complex systems where we don't know the dynamics even, like biochemical systems, high dimensional biochemical systems, complex systems like complex networks, um, non-Newtonian fluids, we don't know which dimensionless parameters um, are important to describe, uh, for example, uh, important bifurcation, uh, bifurcation points. Uh, so how do we use data to um, constrain our, uh, our traditional methods and find the relevant dimensionless numbers if we don't have the equations? Uh, now, before I get there, let's see how do we do it traditionally. Well, traditionally, let's say we have a pendulum with inputs L, M, G, and T, 
the uh, predicted output is alpha, what you can do is you get the governing equations. In that case, it's a simple system, just get the equations. And uh, you non-dimensionalize the equations. So you make sure all these, the, the variables in the equation are dimensionless. And now the coefficients will also be dimensionless. And uh, you just look at the coefficients and see when they're large or small. And they will tell you a lot about the, um, the qualitative behavior of the system uh, when you can get rid of certain terms or keep them. Uh, but there's a shortcut. You can go from the parameters alone and uh, use the Buckingham Pi theorem to get to uh, the, those dimensionless groups. The problem with Buckingham Pi is that it doesn't give you a unique set of these dimensionless groups. And what we want to do is use data to get a more unique set or uh, dimensionless groups that are relevant in a specific context. So let's uh, dive a bit deeper into the details of the method. Uh, what does the Buckingham Pi theorem actually say? So let's say we have some input parameters and some output uh, predictions, um, and there's, we know that there's a mapping that maps the input to the outputs. Usually that's a solution to a differential equation. And the Buckingham Pi theorem says that we can uh, transform these input and output parameters into dimensionless input and output. They have no units. And um, it says that uh, there is some kind of mapping that maps those dimensionless inputs to the dimensionless outputs with some function psi. It doesn't say anything about what that psi is, but it says that it exists. Now, uh, uh, Buckingham Pi theorem, again, says it uh, doesn't give you a unique set of these dimensionless groups. So uh, how do we kind of make that mapping more unique? That's our problem. Now, we know that the relationship between dimensionless input and output parameters and the actual input and output parameters is given by this equation. Uh, which basically says that it's a product of the input and output parameters raised to some powers, phi i j. And, and these phi i j's um, are unknown. They're given uh, by the Buckingham Pi theorem, as I'll um, express it in a bit. Um, and uh, we can also define a dimensional matrix that takes every input and output uh, variable and parameter and puts it in a column. but doesn't take the parameter itself, takes the omega of the parameter, this function omega. It basically takes the parameter and uh, gives you powers uh, of the dimension, um, uh, of the basic dimensions. Let's say you have a mass, length, and time as basic dimensions or units. Uh, then omega of force, for example, here is given by 1, 1, minus 2. So you put all of these in D. And now the Buckingham Pi theorem basically says that d phi is equal to zero, or that these powers are actually in the null space, the, the, the vector uh, powers are in the null space of d. If you want to look more at what exactly the math is behind this, I encourage you to look at the paper. Now, um, the, given that we're working with data and we're, we want to do some statistical analysis fitting inputs to outputs and getting expectations. We're really working in a probabilistic framework and the probabilistic corollary of uh, the Buckingham Pi theorem is that we're reducing dimensionality from the uh, PQ uh, uh, coordinate system to the Pi P and Pi Q coordinate system uh, without losing any information. So we're preserving the error. We don't know what C is, but uh, we just know that we're uh, not increasing um, the, the, the error of our prediction. And a very important hypothesis that uh, we're proposing here is that the most physically meaningful uh, set of dimensionless numbers, where physically meaningful is something we kind of define in terms of this hypothesis, is, um, is solving this optimization problem. And this optimization problem is uh, actually finding the map between the input, dimensionless inputs and dimensionless outputs through this fitting function psi, but also finding the best uh, uh, coordinate transformation that takes us from the dimensional inputs and outputs to the dimensionless inputs and outputs. So it's a, um, two optimizations happening here, where pi now is sort of a latent variable. So uh, in, in the vein of this assumption, uh, we develop three uh, methods. The first one uses a neural network. The second one uses 
um, d phi equals zero as a hard constraint, it's a constraint optimization problem, and the third one uses sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. So we get an equation and we get the dimensionless numbers. And it's a parametric equation. So um, here I'm going to use uh, the bead on a rotating hoop problem to illustrate uh, the methods. Um, and this is really uh, just a, a ring that uh, has a bead um, at its circumference that can slide with friction B and uh, it rotates with angular velocity omega. And it's given by this non highly nonlinear differential equation uh, where you can see there's sine x times cosine x. x is the angle with the vertical. Um, and if we non-dimensionalize the French, so this, is, this can be derived analytically. Uh, but of course, we're going to assume that we don't know it. And if we non-dimensionalize it, we'll get uh, gamma and epsilon as uh, dimensionless coefficients. And why are these uh, important? Because for a small epsilon, then you have first order system and you don't get oscillation. And for um, a gamma, and gamma here plays uh, also an important role because uh, it reveals the nonlinear dynamical structure of the system uh, because it, ha it, it, it is um, um, a pitchfork, it gives you a pitchfork bifurcation. So for gamma greater than one, you get two extra fixed points for uh, x star equals plus or minus uh, arc cosine gamma. Um, so the first method, the bucky net. Bucky net is basically minimizing this loss function. And what is this complicated loss function? Well, uh, right away you can notice that there is a term that is d times phi. And we're trying to make the norm of that uh, zero. So this is the dimensionless loss constraint, the Buckingham pi constraint. Um, to kind of unpack this part of the loss, uh, we look at this. So uh, we have five input parameters, m, r, b, g, and omega. And uh, we're going to uh, define this bucky net layer that takes these five parameters and compresses them to two um, outputs because we chose that we have two um, input parameters, two dimensionless input parameters. And we log the inputs and we use an exponential um, output uh, uh, activation function. And you can see this is exactly what this expression is. And this is really just casting the problem in terms of this relationship I explained earlier between the dimensionless groups and the dimensional groups. Uh, it is uh, more specifically, the dimensionless groups um, are power products of powers of the dimensional, the dimensional input uh, variables and parameters. Um, and then we define this null space loss, which we put here in the loss function. And uh, once we get this um, dimensionless um, input uh, parameters, we map uh, the inputs to the outputs through uh, just this function, fitting function psi. Now, instead of using x of t as an output, because we didn't account for t in the inputs, uh, we're just using uh, the time modes of uh, the output x of t. And here, x is already dimensionless, so we don't need to non-dimensionalize it. In more general case, we would have to non-dimensionalize it separately. Uh, in a lot of cases, you can just uh, divide the output by some um, scale, uh, known scale in the, in the problem. Now, if we apply this method and we minimize this neural network, the weights, we get this matrix for phi. Something I didn't explicitly mention is that actually the dimensionless uh, groups, what we're looking for uh, are the weights, uh, after we're optimized, are the weights of the first layer. So. Uh, the weight of the first layer, which is the matrix phi, um, is given by this solution, which matches um, the original system. Uh, and that is uh, just given the data and not knowing the underlying equations. Now, of course, in this case, we have to optimize also over hyperparameters. Uh, the choice of C is important, making sure that we're not overfitting and that we're general generalizing over the data. But when we're generalizing well, we get um, the uh, dimensionless groups that we expect in this case. The second method is constraint optimization. Here we're using d phi equals zero as a hard constraint. And c is not really a 
um, a neural network, but it's some non-parametric Gaussian radial basis function that, of course, there, there is variability there. You can choose different uh, mapping functions. And in, in this case, we're using kernel ridge regression uh, optimizer. So to illustrate a different problem in the laminar boundary layer flow, uh, which is a complex problem in fluids and has a rich history, I, uh, you should also look at the paper to look at the background. Uh, but basically, it's a complex problem uh, to solve the stream function, uh, C of x, y. And by doing this simple, relatively simple change of variables, you can reduce the problem to this uh, um, ODE, nonlinear, th third order nonlinear ODE, in eta. So how did we find eta? There's analytical work that's been done to discover this eta historically, but can we do that with data? And the answer is yes, with constraint, uh, constraint optimization, we can find something very close to uh, the dimensionless variable we expect. Um, and the third method is, uh, relies on the fact that physically meaningful equations are really, uh, have to be dimensionally homogeneous, which means every term has to have the same dimension. You can only add apples to apples. And when you non-dimensionalize, what you're doing is basically dividing uh, all the apples by one apple. So you're scaling everything with respect to a given reference. And then you're adding numbers to numbers. And if there's a number that's small for the whole system, you can ignore it and you can proceed by solving part of the equation rather than the full equation. And this is something that I explained in the, in the early, uh, at the beginning of, the, of this presentation. Uh, but the main idea is that dimensionless numbers are constrained uh, uh, often to be in a, a certain uh, equation. So that constraint, we can use that constraint to further constrain our machine learning algorithm. And this is the motivation behind a dimensionless Cindy method. Um, here we're defining a differential equation where the output is pi q, that's uh, our dimensionless output. And we have, now we're also defining a time scale, one over t, so we're non-dimensionalizing time as well. And uh, the output is f of pi uh, q pi t. Uh, so, uh, sorry, this is not the output, this is the right-hand side of the equation. So it's a, it's a, a non-linear differential equation that if we unpack in terms of um, product, here what we're really doing is we're defining a dictionary in terms of pi q, the output, and we have these dimensionless uh, parameters as coefficients of, of the dictionary. And the Kronecker product multiplies all the possible um, suggested uh, parameters, uh, dimensionless parameters by all the possible dictionary terms. And we multiply this by xc, uh, an unknown coefficient, uh, which we're optimizing for. This is um, the Cindy algorithm, but um, it's kind of uh, revamped to include dimensionless parameters and to uh, solve for uh, also the time scale as well. Um, so now our optimization problem is really minimizing this loss. And this loss is, um, uh, really uh, mapping the dimensionless, dimensional input and outputs to the dimensionless inputs and outputs. And it's also um, minimizing C, which are the coefficients of the differential equation. And we're trying, uh, Cindy, part of Cindy is to make this differential equation as sparse as possible. So if there are dimensionless parameters uh, multiplied by dictionary terms that are not uh, significant or that don't satisfy a reasonable uh, uh, mapping in the equation, then they will be set to zero. So <coughs> uh, let's illustrate that on the rotating hoop problem. So we have inputs m, r, b, g, and omega. And uh, we generate from these a table of candidate dimensionless uh, numbers using this constraint, d phi equals zero. We're also uh, generating candidate time scales. And this is a separate algorithm that uh, goes through all the possible vectors in the null space and generates them. So here you have to set uh, maximum and minimum powers for pi p and, and for the time scale. And uh, let's say we want to only work, uh, we want to discover two dimensionless um, input parameters. 
uh, then we choose two, uh, a combination of two, we choose uh, a combination of two here, and we choose um, a time scale from the time scale matrix. And we use these as inputs, um, th these analytic forms and as inputs, and we pass it through the data to get uh, dimensionless inputs and dimensionless outputs with uh, the required time scale. Now the whole point here is that because we're predefining the candidate uh, time scales and the candidate dimensionless uh, parameters, um, we now are optimizing over a discrete space uh, J rather than a continuous space phi. And C here uh, are basically the coefficients of uh, the um, Cindy loss, so we're uh, really uh, solving this optimization problem and there's a sparsity loss here that can, should be added to make this, uh, this um, equation as sparse as possible. And then once we optimize, uh, we solve the Cindy problem basically over all possible combinations and we look at the combination that has the lowest loss, the combination of time scales and uh, dimensionless parameters. And uh, you can see that uh, the discovered one, the one that has the lowest uh, log loss, is, um, gives us this differential equation where the parameters, um, the coefficients pi one and pi two um, are given by one over epsilon and gamma over epsilon. They're equivalent to uh, one over epsilon and gamma over epsilon. Uh, and we know now by looking at these, we can, we can see, we can analyze the solution as one that uh, um, has uh, controls the inertial term and the other controls the pitchfork bifurcation. And if you look at the original system, uh, there uh, these two solutions, these two equations are similar. The difference is, of course, the multiplication by epsilon, uh, but also that here we're only defined a dictionary of polynomials, while here there are terms that have sines and cosines, which we don't know beforehand. Uh, and what we end up with is basically a Taylor expansion of these uh, trigonome trigonometric functions. And as we increase the order of uh, the polynomial in the dictionary, we get more and more accurate uh, Taylor expansion of the differential equation. So these are the three methods that we've developed. And uh, I'm really excited about uh, using these methods to uh, discover new systems, uh, dimensionless groups and new systems. So if you have data where uh, you're trying to discover a model for it or trying to understand the qualitative relationship between the different parameters and the different scales. Uh, it would be really exciting to collaborate on discovering these dimensionless numbers with uh, data and using this method. And if you um, have some ideas on improving the methods, uh, uh, these ideas are welcome. Uh, we always like to collaborate to um, discover new methods and to discover new physics, of course. Thank you. Thank <music> you.